See me at my live. Yes, you are. Okay. okay great. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Francisco Pedraza, and I am an associate professor in the School of Politics and Global Studies here at Arizona State University. And we're in Tempe, Arizona. Delighted to welcome a special guest with us today to talk to us a little bit about politics on the ground uh, here in Arizona. Um, in a moment here, uh, you'll see Professor Mike Slavin, and he's going to be talking to us uh, uh, about some of his insight relating to the dynamic immigration politics uh, that has developed here in the state of Arizona and had repercussions, not only within the state uh, for other issues, but also uh, touches on the way that we think about uh, a variety of issues, including immigration outside of Arizona. Uh, so we're delighted uh, to have Professor Mike Slavin, senior lecturer from the University of Lincoln with us uh, today to share with us some of his book. And I'll let you tell us a little bit more about the title. Sure. Thanks very much. Um, uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you to uh, Francisco Pedrasa for the introduction. Um, I want to thank the Morrison Institute for Public Policy because I am a visiting scholar there. Um, so, so they're the ones who are hosting it, but of course also thanks to the School of Politics and Global Studies for having me today uh, and inviting me to give this talk. So um, back when Arizona passed Senate Bill 1070 in the year 2010, it was widely criticized as something that was really extreme and an outlier from the normal run of uh, US politics, or US immigration politics. As, as it shot to national media attention, uh, it was portrayed as being the most aggressive anti-immigrant law at the state level in the US. Show me your papers provisions were loudly decried as a license uh, for racial profiling. And indeed, part of the reason the law was so electrifying in Arizona politics and became so heavily criticized in the national and even international conversation uh, was how much of an outlier it seemed. It made the state into the butt of jokes, even a pariah. And so, of course, there was a sense after 1070 that Arizona had really pushed the envelope and it was out there alone. Uh, from today's perspective, however, it's clearer that what happened in Arizona's immigration politics was not something isolated or exceptional. It wasn't just some outlier event that happened once in one corner of the Arizona or the US-Mexico borderlands. Instead, it foreshadowed larger political trends uh, that have taken hold in many places across the globe. And on the national scene, uh, Arizona has, of course, frequently served as the epicenter for U.S. immigration controversies. Uh, SB 1070, in, even as soon as 2010, 2011, was quickly inspiring a number of other provisions that are similar in other states, uh, none of which equal the notoriety of the Arizona law, but were there. And of course, there was something larger brewing in terms of the elevation of immigration by actors on the right as a newly prominent campaign issue one that would tap into disaffection in the electorate, uh, be used to wage factional battles within the Republican Party, and seek new political supporters among those who perceived existing racial hierarchies as under threat. And indeed, when Donald Trump initially ran for president in 2016, uh, featuring immigration as a huge part of his campaign, the media across the country quickly associated his approach with figures in Arizona like former Governor Jan Brewer. Furthermore, events in Arizona have also seemed to develop uh, to foretell developments internationally, not just on the national scene. Immigration has become an increasingly salient issue associated with new forms of more authoritarian politics, also in Europe. And in the 2010s, of course, Europe experienced a major amplification of its immigration politics. In a number of countries and on the European Union level, a familiar pattern was repeating, where amid talk of an, inten of an intensifying border security crisis, policies that would have pre previously been considered extreme were enacted. And these policies formed part of a wider securitization of migration, the process by which this really contested and complex issue becomes treated overwhelmingly as a security problem. Now, as immigration has become cemented as a major electoral issue, it has in many ways been the tip of the spear in this rise of more authoritarian politics, which is part of the huge national conversation today, a wedge issue that has been used by these political forces to gain an in on the national conversations uh, here and internationally in Europe too. In Europe, immigration has provided a launch pad for increased success for farther right parties, likewise forcing traditional governing forces into defensive positions. So standing here in 2022, we can conclude that perhaps Arizona wasn't so alone after all, but rather one part of much wider developments, even if it was a bit ahead of some other places. But of course, 
We're also not in the same place politically in Arizona in 2022, as was the case in 2010. Immigration and the border remain big political issues, as we've seen on the airwaves in the gubernatorial election just this week. But the contours of these issues have changed in the last 12 years. On the state level, policy action on the border has been much less frenetic and much less driven by the farther right wing in state politics after 2011 than it was in the years before. That year, new proposals of the Arizona border hawks in the legislature were blocked, and the chief one in the legislature, Russell Pierce, was, of course, recalled and removed from the state Senate, developments that at the time surprised a lot of people. And in general, the political appeal of hardline approaches on immigration in Arizona has declined, and in the aftermath of 1070, it's become, the state has become much more evenly divided in partisan terms, more diverse in its electorate, and of course has seen the rising influence of young Latino and Latina activists especially. So while immigration and the border do remain very significant public issues in Arizona, they have not in many years dominated the political scene in the way that they once did. So what does this trajectory in Arizona have to teach us about migration politics worldwide? That's the big question of this talk. How can Arizona's experience shed light on why the treatment of migration as a security issue can advance so far, and how positions on immigration previously regarded as extreme can become mainstream? Uh, so these are the questions that I try to address in my book, and I will show you the cover, uh, because what the good is a book talk without seeing the nicely designed cover, thanks to the people at Columbia University Press, uh, for publishing Securing Borders, Securing Power, which is out as of just last month. Um, so these are questions that started turning in my head when I was working in the Arizona governor's office in the 2000s and later in Washington, D.C., but they're also ones that have only become more prominent to me as I've spent most of the last decade plus in Europe, where strikingly familiar patterns have played out, ones that were recognizable from Arizona. So as I did the research for this book, piecing together the progression in Arizona to SB 1070 and its fallout, speaking to the Arizona policymakers who were involved in this era, these were, of course, the big questions in my mind. And one of the goals of this work is to connect what happened here in Arizona to these much broader global debates and conversations. So in this talk, I want to specify some lessons that I think Arizona politics uh, presents for global migration politics. And I'll discuss six that come out of my research. There are more uh, from other people's, but I'll talk about six. And since the subtitle of the book is The Rise and Decline of Arizona's Border Politics, which I'm a little nervous about, uh, but we'll have three of them that have to do with the rise part, uh, what Arizona has to say about how and why these politics intensify and previously extreme becomes mainstream while the other three will have to do with the decline part. So how this process can break down and new political configurations can emerge. And after that, I'll discuss some caveats, why we should be too cautious about Trump maybe trying to learn too much from Arizona. Uh, but first I wanna discuss some elements of this broader political situation that Arizona shed light on, sheds light on. So some of the puzzles that we see in wider migration politics. Um, by this point, we may be used to immigration being a significant political issue, especially here in Arizona. And after the Trump presidency or even the response to the summer of migration in Europe in 2015, it may seem obvious that hardline appeals on immigration have, have political potential. However, there are a number of conditions that make this larger tradition, issue trajectory somewhat puzzling and which Arizona may in fact shed some light on. So first, where the political traction for hardline policy on immigration has increased, this hasn't generally seemingly been because the public has become more anti-immigration. In fact, the opposite seems to be true. Uh, polling in the US shows a slow long run increases in positive attitudes about immigration and immigrants. And it's not just a function of demographic changes unique to the United States because similar changes in public attitudes are also happening in Western European countries too, as measured in all the good social surveys that they do over there. So more hardline stances on immigration don't seem to derive from these changes in public opinion. And in many senses, public opinion no longer appears as anti-immigration as most of the classic texts in the immigration politics literature field would assume. Uh, so what's, uh, what is underlying these changes in the political system's policy outputs on the issue or in the ways that politicians approach it? Um, indeed, the immigration views of the general public across many countries, not least the United States, are typically quite complex. There's typically majority support for a number of different kinds of approaches toward immigration. For example, in Arizona, there's been a clear majority support in polls dating back at least 15 years, maybe even 20 years, for not just increasing border security, but also increasing legal channels for migration and creating new pathways for regularization for undocumented. 
And Arizona, of course, was the birthplace of the U.S. sanctuary movement in the 80s, and there has frequently been very prominent public advocacy for humanitarian or economic ways of trying to look at the border. But in what I call the SB 1070 era, so from about 2004 to 2011, there were nonetheless about 100 proposed or enacted state policies dealing with immigration as a security issue in Arizona, but only one actually viable proposal to address the issue through a different lens, an economic lens. And likewise, in many countries around the world, policies have become more hardline and securitized and dominated by the security aspect of the issue. So even amid, amid major political dispute and when there would seem to be political material for a very, for a much more varied type of political contest or policy effort, um, nonetheless, security has often dominated these discussions. So why is that happening? All of this has culminated in the increased political prominence of immigration views that would have previously been considered to be on the fringes. That is the mainstreaming of both farther right views of migration and the mainstreaming of the far right as a more acceptable political participant via the issue of immigration. So watching the progression of the issue of, in Arizona from the early 2000s, one of the most striking aspects, and I discussed this in my book, is how quickly ideas that were considered by most people to be fringe, uh, including by legislators and people in the policymaking system, uh, very quickly came to be embraced by parts of the political mainstream or treated as legitimate topics for mainstream political discussion. Uh, most policymakers have regarded the ideas that were eventually contained in SB 1070 to be outlandish just a few years before it passed. But rather than continue to wander in the wilderness, these ideas and the people who are, who are proposing them were successfully thrust into the center of political conversation in the state, uh, which then encouraged a lot of imitators who tried to exploit the issue. So how and why the previous fringes on the right have become part of the mainstream is, of course, a key question in the politics of a lot of countries. Immigration has been seized upon as an essential wedge issue in this process. But how has this worked when I've just, as if it's the case as I've just described, the public opinion isn't solidly behind these developments? And how have far the right upstarts succeeded in the political arena when their establishment competitors presumably have the clout and the political resources to keep them on the margins? Uh, one final puzzle here is more temporal. It's that these hardline policy responses often have not really tracked with any kind of measurements of the problem. So 1070, for instance, was passed even though regular cross-border traffic in Arizona at that time had already fallen to historic lows. And similarly, in countries like Italy, uh, they, the governments have become more hardline about irregular border crossing well after irregular border crossing has peaked. Um, so to start to get to the lessons about this, um, we'll start with how this politics rises and consolidates. Um, so yeah, what can it teach? What can the Arizona case teach us about these big questions? So first is <clears throat> the rise of hardline immigration politics is much less about public opinion in general than about coalition politics on the right. So for parties in parliamentary democracies, how to win votes from, how to steal votes over from farther right parties that might be trying to appeal to people in immigration, and how to forge uh, later on, once the elections have happened, to forge governing coalitions among parties themselves. <clears throat> and in the United States, where the electoral system is different, how about how the Republican Party can keep, uh, keep together, right, functioning coalitions? Uh, at the voter level in terms of who votes for the party and at the elite level in terms of how different parts and factions of the party get along. Uh, this ride, the rise of this kind of politics is not about major changes in public attitudes, as I mentioned earlier. So when I was researching how immigration politics developed in Arizona in the early 2000s, what struck me is how it started out as the pet issue of one particular faction of the Republican Party, which was a significant force in the party, but was not its dominant faction. And these are people who, for shorthand in the book, I call the border hawks, right? So Russell Pierce, other legislators like him. Other Republicans, apart from them, did not necessarily oppose more border security, uh, but it wasn't a top priority or an ideological commitment uh, to pursue these kind of envelope pushing measures. It wasn't something that they were really themselves wanting to do. Of course, the Arizona Republican Party was already factionally riven by this point between a more radical, right-wing activist base on one side and a more conservative business-oriented wing on the other, as we continue to see today, for instance, in the gubernatorial primary that just concluded last month. And indeed, the former uh, the, the right-wing activists tended to think that immigration and border security were a much bigger deal than the latter. Now, 
we may assume that dominant factions within parties like the Arizona Republican Party uh, can use their political resources to keep the fringes marginalized, uh, though perhaps with occasional concessions. Similarly, we may assume that in countries where the far right competes sort of directly with more traditional governing parties of the center right, so a lot of European countries which have different electoral systems, the latter parties will use their greater resources to keep those parties on the fringes. And of course, we now know that this doesn't always happen. It, this does, that this does not always work. And we know that the immigration issue is one right to disrupt these dynamics of who's considered to be the mainstream and who's considered to be the fringe. But, and exactly why this is, I think I'll talk about shortly. But first, the takeaway is that these coalitional politics among the right are why policy can get more hard line on immigration, even as public attitudes toward immigrants and immigration overall warm. So traditional center-right governing forces, which may be more sympathetic to seeing immigration, for instance, as an economic thing, uh, face the problem of keeping assertive challengers within the fold, or at least not letting them sap too much power from in a system like Arizona's with primary elections, of course, the center-right uh, candidates also face the problem of factional challenges within the primaries. And as they become more prominent in public debate, as the issue becomes more prominent in public debate and the far right becomes more prominent, campaigning on immigration border issues further offer things that can appeal to center-right politicians. It can excite and deeply engage a portion of the grassroots or a portion of the primary or electorate. It can attract some voters who might not find as much appeal in conservative economic platforms. And while there may be concerns about alienating minorities or more moderate voters, the candidates have to get through the primaries first to be at the table. So border security changes from a factional fixation to an issue of much greater activity across the right, just due to coalition politics. And this can happen regardless of what the left is doing, though the center left is also simultaneously triangulating on this issue, as I'll talk about in a bit. So the upshot of this is somewhat sobering, perhaps, for more pro-immigrant advocates. Uh, it's very possible for pro-immigrant campaigners to be winning the conversation in the wider culture about immigration, having more people more accepting of immigrants, yet to see periods of very intense anti-immigrant policy due to the importance of the issue to factional politics on the right. And this only looks to deepen as immigration continues to become a more sordid issue, where voters' views on it more strongly correlate to which party they vote for, which did not used to be the case really uh, in politics in the US or Europe, but is increasingly so. So a second lesson about the rise of this politics uh, for the rest of the world is that this process of mainstreaming is fueled specifically by the security claims involved, which is one of the main arguments of my book. And I argue that the security dimensions of the issue are especially important to why immigration has been a key issue in this mainstreaming of more far-right ideas, which has not usually been acknowledged as such in the discussions of mainstreaming. And indeed, the far right has become less successful, has, has been much less successful at, for instance, staking out territory on the economy, the welfare state, other social issues, or more traditional security issues. And as others as have noted, uh, campaigning and immigration has really been the sine qua non of their success. It's the one issue where they really seem to have gotten an in. Now, when immigration first began its rise as an issue on the state level in Arizona, many of the officials who didn't really favor more state action on it responded in ways that we would expect. They tried to downplay the issue, saying it was being overblown, or they tried to say, actually, this is a federal responsibility, this isn't a debate for us to have here, or they tried to ignore uh, the ideas that the border hawks were bringing in front of the legislature. But very quickly, they shifted from these approaches. And why did they do this? In part, it was because of the particular impact that the successful framing of immigration as a security issue had upon competitive political dynamics. And this changes the way that politicians think that it makes sense to deal with the issue. After the success of the anti-immigration Proposition 200 ballot initiative in 2004, Arizona politicians were figuring out how they needed to position themselves on the issue. And when they downplayed or tried to ignore an issue which was already widely portrayed in the media, as one of security, they found that this did not, in their words, resonate. Rather quickly, the idea that the Arizona public was anxious and fearful about the border and demanding action took hold as a bedrock assumption among people across the political field in Arizona. So not just the far right, but also people in the center right and the center left. Um, this is where I kind of fly a flag as a qualitative researcher and as a scholar who takes an interpretive approach to social science. So in calibrating on an issue like immigration, this is not like sliding along a number line from left to right. Discussing an issue as security brings new meanings into the issue that weren't there as prominently before. And once people accept that an issue is framed as one as security, they found it was untenable to try to step away from it 
We tried to deny responsibility for it, for instance, by saying that it's a federal responsibility. And this is because the basic meanings that security brings into the issue, those of kind of urgency, threat, and necessity. Um, I'm going to speed up what I'm saying just so that we leave enough time in the hour for, uh, for talk. So another key lesson to bring uh, forward from Arizona is that this politics advances even when moderates occupy key veto points in the process. So of course that's a bit implied by what I've said earlier, but how does exactly is this supposed to work? Um, when people who don't agree with this approach actually have many opportunities to stop it from happening, why doesn't that exactly occur? I think one important takeaway for, from this is that there, the process that leads up to something like SB 1070 and any kind of younger people in the audience who weren't alive at this time or weren't paying, or they're probably alive, but maybe a bit too young to remember, uh, you know, there was a lot that came before 1070. Uh, it's, there were major issues about the National Guard on the border. There were major issues about employer sanctions, punishing employers who hire unauthorized labor in particular. And it was the 2007 employer sanctions bill which passed, which before 1070 was largely considered the most, you know, the most uh, hardline state policy on immigration in the country. So this process is composed of decisions that are made up by a lot of people, including a lot of mainstream political actors, a lot of more centrist political actors who might not think that this is the right way to approach the issue. So what's driving their calculations to concede on it rather than stand firm? Well, I've discussed this a bit on the right, but of course this is an issue on the center left too. It's not just about right-wing votes. Um, one, the major issue here is that moderates face an asymmetric contest when it comes to this. So for the farther right, immigration is a really important issue. This is something that they care about a lot. The faction in the legislature that's pushing it um, are very concerned about immigration as a key area where they want to make changes to pursue a preferred social vision. But this is not really the case for centrist, centrist figures. And it has not typically been the case in the US or Europe. The major governing parties historically do not like campaigning on immigration. Um, before 2016, it I don't even know how long it had been since there was a presidential campaign that was mainly about immigration. It's not been an issue that major parties have typically wanted to talk about in order to pursue a particular social vision. It may be something that these people have an opinion about, but it's not an area that they want to drive the agenda. So when talking to Arizona policymakers from this time, a lot of them said things like, this was not a major issue to us. It was not an issue that we really had extremely strong priorities about, but it was an issue that was important to the voters that we were getting pressured on. So we needed to figure, to figure out how to do something about it. Now, these strategies can be very successful for people at the center. Democrats in particular at this time were able to hold on to their power quite successfully. Republicans were much, up until 1070, Republicans were much more vulnerable in primaries. So Republicans who disagreed with this uh, approach were very politically vulnerable. But while it can be politically effective, of course, what it does is concedes continual ground to the far the right and it further cements the framing of the issue. So and more it, it effectively establishes this as a topic of mainstream conversation. And this is driven mainly by the fact that there's an asymmetric contest. It's much more important to one side of the equation than to the other. And the other to the other side of the equation, it is a issue, issue that is appropriate to compromise on in order to hold power, stay at the table and get done other things that you want to do. So perhaps not a very nice picture, but let's talk about some lessons about how this politics declines, something that may not have yet been seen as much in other countries that have experienced this kind of intense border politics, but which has happened in Arizona relatively, at least compared to before, and which is something that maybe we're perhaps foreshadowing uh, again, we'll see, right? So one thing that's really important to the decline of this politics is what are the highly contextual um, calculations of the center right? Um, and it, what activists did to oppose 1070, to oppose bills like 1070 were absolutely key. I'll get onto that next. But the essential kind of uh, pivot point faction in deciding that that era was over in Arizona were basically business Republicans in the legislature. It wasn't until they decided to put their foot down that there was no more space open for the border hawks to push their agenda. Um, so why did they do this? Well, perhaps unfortunately for people who are trying to win them over, uh, this is a very situation dependent judgment. It is not highly principled. Now, a lot of these 
uh, border hawks did not, or sorry, these more business oriented, relatively moderate chamber oriented Republicans, or at least people have moderate views on immigration, relatively speaking. Um, they didn't like the border hawks or what they were doing, but they were willing to put up with a lot. Right? They were willing to put up with a lot in the name of party unity. They were willing to put up in the, a lot in the name of winning these elections. And they really held their noses a lot when it came to these sorts of policies. Um, so what made them change? Well, it was because the issue was getting too intense. Um, it was not because they had any fundamental problem with 1070. The activists absolutely never convinced them that 1070 was as bad as they said it was. And they said this in interviews to me. Uh, we, I still don't believe that, that 1070 did all the things that they said it did, right? But nonetheless, it had become such a disruptive thing uh, to the economy that they decided, yeah, we have, to, we have to take the foot off the gas when it comes to this. Now, this is what actually does matter to this faction, which is they do want to maintain uh, generally social conditions for economic growth and for economic exchange. And if that is threatened, then they will do something about it. But for instance, the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry tolerated the employer sanctions bill three years earlier, which had a direct impact on the operation of businesses in Arizona. They, when SB 1070 was being debated, said they were neutral on it, right? They did not take a stance against that kind of thing until there were already problems. So this is perhaps a, not such a comforting lesson, right? Because, because this judgment is so contextual and not really principled, it's very hard to necessarily, as activists or as outside people trying to pressure this faction, get them to do a particular thing. It really just depends on how hot the environment has become. Um, now, nonetheless, they are, or have been at least, a politically pivotal block in deciding this. And the center-right, of course, in many uh, political circumstances will just tend, will by happenstance, occupy that middle point. Um, so perhaps not such a comforting story because they can be uh, a very important block. To the extent to which this is true, I'll discuss in the caveats of that. Um, but to get to the activist part of it, another important lesson from Arizona is that direct confrontation, including about racism, was actually key to the end of this era. So we have had this debate right, in the aftermath of the summer of 2020, the summer of protests, the George Floyd protests, about, uh, well, is it good for the Democrats to associate with activists who, who talk a lot about racial injustice? Is it wise to campaign on these sorts of issues, or should the Democrats campaign on things that are more popular with white voters, like economic issues? What exactly comprises this popular agenda? I'm not, I'm not sure it's as evident to me as to some of the people who make this argument, but nonetheless, that's how it goes. Now, the whole idea there is that, well, Democrats can't afford to associate too closely with these activist groups because they're making claims about racism that, of course, alienate these white voters in the middle that they need to win. But you ask what happened with SB 1070, we had a progression, right, up to that point where centrists were kind of giving an inch and giving an inch and giving an inch. And then when, when the border hawks had a window of opportunity when power changed in Arizona, SB 1070 came out of that, right, when they had a Republican governor who would sign it. Um, and then the issue, of course, kind of broke loose. And what ended that era were these more confrontational approaches. Again, they never convinced the center right and the Republican Party that the law was really racist or that it did really allow racial profiling. But the fact that this dominated the national conversation was what unnerved them to uh, stop this in Arizona or to say, we wanna focus on other issues and we're going to assert our power to make sure that the party starts to focus more on other issues and starts to focus less on this sort of thing. So it was impossible to, for that to happen without the Latino and Latina activists who made this point very prominently on the streets, in the media, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they said what many elected Democrats up to this point had decided that they were hesitant to do, which was say this was racist and discriminatory. Now, back in 2005, some Democrats were saying this in the aftermath of Proposition 200, which instituted some voter ID laws and was about trying to make uh, benefits, welfare benefits unavailable to unauthorized immigrants. And they decided at that point that this wasn't resonating. They needed a different message. And then they quickly consolidated on agreeing that this is a security issue and doing some stuff with 
um, allowing state law enforcement to combat smuggling, for instance, and various other policies, which are discussed at length in my book. But did this eventual strategy, right, with by activists where they said these are racist laws and we should oppose them for that reason, did it alienate white voters in the middle? Yeah, probably it did, right? The 2010 election results, which in which the Democrats were wiped out, of course, it was a bad year for Democrats across the country, would suggest that it was not necessarily the best election year line. However, um, it was impossible for this turn in the issue to happen unless that did occur. Right? It's what made the controversy intense enough to make some Republicans want to halt what had been that by that point a 70 year long progression of the issue and to say, we don't want this anymore. So, of course, I'm not, you know, if, if I'm not advising on political strategy, but it, the Arizona case definitely seems to suggest it is not always the case that parties should not associate with these sorts of activists. Sometimes making these points is key to actually getting a bigger change. So finally, uh, last lesson of Arizona for migration politics is kind of larger and more abstract. And it's one that, especially if there are any students listening, I think is important to hear, right? Which is that these things do change. Um, academically, we often discuss this sec security as being this very strong tool for political mobilization behind existing elites uh, to shore up the powers that be, to give uh, the current leaders more power, right? And that security, of course, can be this way of mobilizing anti-immigrant attitudes that enforce often racist bordering policies and that uphold certain images of social order and racial hierarchy. And of course, these larger discussions that have happened, especially in the past few years about race in the United States and also in Europe, have suggested that you know, racism is really enduring as a fact of social life and that it's it always takes on new forms and is difficult to escape. So there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of reasons maybe to be doubtful or uh, about the ability for things to really change, given the strength of these trends and the enduring fact of these things in social life. But um, Arizona does suggest, just by being in 2022 in the situation here now, as opposed to 2010, that there there can be changes, right? That activism and engagement can at least cool things down and make things a bit better if you're coming from the perspective of somebody who's more sympathetic to immigrants and immigration. Um, and that these politics, even though they're on the margin in a lot of places, are not destined to play out a single way, right? Once, we ex once there is broad acceptance that security is an immigration issue, it does not necessarily mean that the border will be militarized forever, right? There are always opportunities there to try to intervene and that sometimes are effective in making a change. Um, and that's important in particular with regard, I guess, to the literature on security, which tends to see these, these politics as successful as playing out in a particular way that reaffirms these hierarchies kind of indefinitely and creates new social conditions defined by these insecurities. So what are some of the caveats to these lessons? Uh, you know, what, before I get too far ahead of myself, why is it that we might not be able to extrapolate Arizona to everywhere, right? Um, of course, there are lots of reasons. One that bears mentioning is the stability of this post-2011 settlement in Arizona. It has been the case since 2011, since the Border Hawks bills were defeated on the floor of the state Senate in March of 2011, that there has not been the same level of intensity of policymaking at the state level about immigration and the border as there was before. It is still an issue. You still see Doug Ducey doing some things on it, but you also see the governor, for instance, having to retreat from trying to make the SB, some SB 1070 uh, provisions into parts of the state constitution, right? Um, there is a There are downsides to taking an aggressive point, a stance on this, which are more visible now than before. Now, how stable is this? Um, well, I guess you can't assume that it will go on forever, and we'll see what happens in the elections in a couple of months. Uh, of course, we are looking at a lot of far-right candidates who have very aggressive views on immigration, and they have largely campaigned on other things, right? Uh, they've talked more about, uh, so far, things like the 2020 election rather than immigration as prominently. So that's worth thinking about. Um, now, if you're talking about these intraparty dynamics in the Republican Party that eventually per that permitted this thing to happen at first and then eventually slowed it down, um, of course, we're in a different place when it comes to Republican Party politics now. Uh, what happened in Arizona was that the relative center right in the party 
kind of found its backbone, even after it had seemed to be completely cowed into submission on the Border Hawk agenda. In 2010, only one Republican who was retiring voted against SB 1070 in the legislature. But by the next year, there were six or seven in the Senate who decided no more on this, right? Would that happen again today in the Republican Party? It's a good question. Obviously, a lot's happened in the Republican Party uh, in terms of these factional battles and in terms of the assertion of, of the far right factions of the party as being the dominant ones. Um, and while one of the lessons is maybe that this strange bedfellows can emerge, uh, and they did in Arizona, um, whether that could happen again today is maybe a little less in doubt. Can anti immigrant politics uh, make a place into a pariah so easily as before? One of the things about this whole presentation is that I've said, well, the rest of the world has seen things a bit more like what happened in Arizona. Um, when that's the case, perhaps it's not possible to say this place is really an outlier, right? They've done something really extreme and unacceptable, which was part of the whole way that this politics kind of started to slow down in 2011, 2012. Um, in the global scene of today, where you have these sorts of securitizing policies across many countries, not just, and of course you have witnessed what's happened to the immigration issue at the national level in the United States, um, could that happen to a state again? I don't know. Um, and I, we, I suppose we'll have to find out whether or not the relative decline of border politics in Arizona uh, does foretell these other developments. And finally, Arizona has particular people, right? It has particular demographics. Um, Arizona, of course, has a large uh, Hispanic population, uh, and the mobilization of this group has been very important in this story. Uh, but it also has relatively small numbers of rural white voters when that's the demographic that's been seemed to be really uh, taken away by uh, appeals on border security, right, in other states. So if that's the kind of main faction for the or main demographic for the Trump faction of the Republican Party, Arizona doesn't have as many of those. It's a heavily urbanized place, or suburbanized rather. Um, for instance, in Texas, we see uh, Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, deciding to take a, you know, quite aggressive actions when it comes to immigration on the border. Um, the sorts of things that Republicans have decided not to do in Arizona, or at least most Republicans have decided not to do since 1070. Greg Abbott has not paid a particular price for this, right? So uh, we, Texas is different. All these states are different. Um, maybe Arizona's demographics are particularly favorable to this type of new political configuration emerging from the heat of this politics. But I do want to emphasize, right, that people that things can change. Uh, that just as um, just as this was such an intense trend that no one saw its end coming, right? Uh, maybe we they maybe that's something that we can replicate or see replicated across the world. Um, so I will stop there and I'm happy to converse with anyone here, anyone online. Thank you for coming. Um, yeah, I'll let Francisco uh, moderate this. Yeah, great. Um, uh, briefly invite everyone online. We see a number of you attending uh, with us today virtually. Feel free to start populating the window with questions. Um, we'll start out by inviting the folks who are in person to show by raising your hand if you have a question that you'd like to professor. So, uh, yeah, go ahead, Paul. Sure. Uh, thanks. Very interesting uh, talk. It, it refreshed my memory about a lot of uh, things that were happening. Um, when a colleague and I uh, interviewed, I think the then executive director of the Phoenix Chamber of Commerce. Um, in the early 20 teens about uh, the chamber's posture with regard to SB 1070, he admitted they didn't even have it on their, their list of bills yeah. to watch in the legislature. Um, and uh, it just seemed a matter of kind of obliviousness that you know, what you describe is uh, you know, what the public opinion scholars might talk about salience, that this is just an issue that was a number one for uh, the, the right wing part of the Republican Party, and just um, you know, ranked so far below that for sort of typical chamber Republicans who are more concerned about regulation and taxes and so forth. Um, so I wonder how much of this was. You, you talk about the, the, the sort of moderate 
wing of the Republican Party here um, being willing to compromise and be chipped away at over time. And I wonder just how much of it is kind of strategic miscalculation. It was only when 1070 sort of was being talked about nationally and all these groups were boycotting Arizona. It was really hurting the hospitality industry and so forth. Yeah. And then suddenly in 2011, you get the heads of lots of the major corporations signing this letter to the legislature that they yeah. don't want any more laws like this, but it seems like uh, uh, very much after the, after the fact. But you know, I wonder about the loss of power of the kind of mm -hmm. Chamber of Commerce wing of the Republican Party more generally, because yeah. you see in the Trump administration, you know, backtracking on free trade agreements. And, um, it's interesting because I was talking to I was talking to somebody recently about this, a big scholar on U.S. migration politics. It's like, what's happening with the with the business community? Because obviously, the country desperately needs workers. For instance, uh, we can see that in the current economy. So why haven't why aren't they more engaged on immigration? I think the basic issue, right, is that a they're much more concerned about tax cuts and low regulation, right? Um, now, one of the reasons I think that it is not just myopia, but actually there was, a, there was actual concessions and compromise happening with this wing is because a lot of these people uh, in the bis relative business wing of the party for 4 10, 70, were coming under withering attack from the right wing for not voting for the border hawk stuff, right? They came under intense pressure in precinct committee meetings, people shouting at them, they got constituent emails, they got people filing and you know, supported in the primaries to run against them. They, they were told you know, what people in that part of the party wanted to do. And when they didn't go along with it, they really got an earful about it. So they were well aware that they would need to change and calibrate on the issue. They were not, it was not simply oblivious. Now the, now the chamber stuff, right? Now the chambers of commerce, I think part of it with 1070 and one thing that kind of repeated in the interviews that I did is that People didn't exactly see the size of that controversy coming. Why? Well, because we heard this bill last year, right? <laughs> uh, people have been proposing in 2004, 2005, 2006. Um, Russell Pierce has been up with it. Other guys in the legislature or women who have similar views are doing the same thing. Um, you know, this is like the continuing drumbeat that has been happening for six years or seven years at this point. And it struck, it's caught people by surprise, the size of the controversy. And that's when the chamber position on it really changed. And of course, they're more interested in the, in the, in the tax breaks and, and low regulation side of it, which is why, of course, they remain part of the, basically in the Republican fold, uh, despite not liking a lot of stuff that's come out of the far right of the party. Still, they're willing to give them the tax breaks and low regulations and low regulation. And that's kind of what's kept them in, I think. Does that help to answer what you're saying, what you're asking about? Yeah, okay. uh, yeah. I, I certainly see it strategically from the standpoint of the moderate conservatives in the legislature, but then the yeah. sort of the, the business community as a kind of lobbying force that yeah. was more wondering about it. So, yeah, and, and one of the things that I discuss in the book is that the business community really likes elite politics, right? They like having their friends in in policy making positions where they can say, hey, we need this to happen, we need that to happen. Right, engaging in a, like a major political controversy is not a point of comfort for them, <laughs> uh, where they have to go out in public and make arguments about why this whole thing has not been good. Right, um, so they really rely on their friends to get things done rather than kind of making larger public uh, pronouncements about major social controversies. So it's not would not have been in their normal repertoire to do that. Right, uh, when it came to the assembly, this and something like that. Thank you for that. It's, I, we'll talk. It's, it's, it's a very interesting aspect of this whole thing. I certainly can talk a lot about. And any other questions from the in person audience? Well, I have a, a question that I'd like to ask. Oh, so, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. So I, I was, I've been, I've been here since, since I was a, a little kid, but I didn't really follow the, all this kind of stuff. Exactly, but just sort of on the fringes. And it sort of seemed to me in my mind that there were businesses that needed a lot of labor, yes. and a, lot of, a lot of cheap labor. Yeah. And in my mind, it sort of fell into two, two things, one of which was hotels that I know something about mm -hmm. and just 
cleaning rooms and cleaning a lot of them very fast is not something a regular American would want to do. And then, of course, construction, which is really yeah. hard work. Mm -hmm. But but so so they needed the labor, but they also wanted to get it cheap. So in mm -hmm. my mind, knowing nothing about this, it sort of seemed to me that as the groundswell uh, became more and more anti-immigrant, as Sheriff Joe Pyro yeah. said at the time too, it seemed to me that irrespective of what the opinion of mainstream Republicans was, uh, whether they were pro or anti all these, mm -hmm. these things, it seemed, I thought that big business would always come to them and say, like mayor's corporation said, hey, you know, we need all this labor, you know, see what you can do not to pass all this. Stuff. And you know, this is- right. I didn't, I don't know, but that, that was my- Well, that is the default assumption yeah. of the that literature on the political economy of migration, yeah. <laughs> right? Which is that, Businesses need labor. They're well organized. Well, they'll get, yeah, they need cheap labor. They need more workers. They're well organized politically, and they'll go and they'll make sure that nothing disrupts this. Right? They'll keep a stable paradigm that is generally. Yeah, because they've got the lobbyists and stuff. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I right. I mean, no. Your assumption is the same as yeah. as you know the very famous political economy of migration scholars. But of course, we see that's not really the case. Oh, right. See, that's that's <laughs> what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to. We can figure about yeah that. yeah I mean what happens is that yes they, they they these businesses do need workers and they want them cheap but they also you know want maybe low taxes are more important to them so they tolerate all this stuff happening in the party um, but certainly it's the case that business has been a hugely powerful constituency in Arizona for a very long time and it was definitely the case before all this bubble started bubbling up in a very clear way in the early two thousands that. That a lid was kept on this yeah. by the business community who said, yeah, well, we need people working in hotels, construction, restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. You had identified Latino activists as playing a central role. And one thing I was curious to know is what were some of the tools or strategies that Latino activists um, implemented and which did you find or did you identify or view as the ones that were particularly effective in, in, and who did they pressure? Who, what, yeah. what did they do? What did it do that, that sort of leads you to believe we should credit them? So there is a lot of scholarship on, the act, on these activists, right? And this is, I should say, this is not my, you know, activism is not my specific expertise, but I can talk about what seems to move the needle in terms of elite politics, right? So, of course, there has been really prominent organizing, like going like the 2006 marches, for instance, in response to the Sunsenbrenner bill in Congress. Uh, some of these happened across the country, and some of the biggest ones were in Arizona, but they didn't really seem to move the needle on what happened in the states. There were occasionally really big, really visible mobilizations, uh, which nonetheless didn't seem to have immediate impacts upon um, upon this. And, and I should say it's impossible to know ahead of time what will, right? Uh, the re very reason you have intense debates among activists is because these answers are not obvious, <laughs> you know, in the context in which they're operating, certain things might work. What did ultimately sway elite uh, opinions in Arizona to the point where the ch changes in the, in the approach to state government happened was the media coverage, right? When this became very particular to Arizona and very saturated in the national media, that's what made a big difference. And later on, you know, I was talking to some people involved in the Democratic Party. Of course, there were some uh, Latino, Latino elected officials who were also involved in organizing this kind of stuff who have very direct connections to, to the activist world. Um, and they say that, you know, we learned from SB 1070 how to kind of approach these major, these issues that seem to be major national political controversies, how to use this controversy to get that kind of attention and get this stuff eased off of, right? So, so there is a sense that, um, at least in the, not just in the activist realm, but the political realm, that important lessons were learned, that if we had known what we know now, we would have seen different stuff happening and tried to get the bill vetoed, right? But the really key thing, and the thing, thing that both was unpredictable to people and that ended up being so important, was the level of coverage in the national media that engaged the national media and engaged all sorts of national groups and people in this stuff too. So. I mean, there's no silver bullet, but that is, I think, what made the difference in this case. 
Um, so did you find that as the valley has grown and how when central Phoenix has started to merge into the suburban cities surrounding it, that that perception has changed in the different regions mm -hmm. or, you know, because the central valley, central Phoenix is, you know, much more on the left side and the suburbia, the farther out you go and the more rural you go, it might yeah. go out the other way. And so as the suburban cities surrounding Phoenix has grown, has you found that the population in those surrounding cities has changed with it? So as somebody who grew up in Central and Northern, right, <laughs> uh, this is a great question. So uh, coming, Central and Northern used to be pretty, it's right south of Sunny Slope, which is more working class, but it used to be a pretty Republican area, uh, upper middle class area. Um, now, over time, that is the partisan preferences have flipped, right? Uh, now, is, what is that kind of the, the core of this, the urbanity of Phoenix emanating? I mean, you talk, you could talk to political geographers about this, um, but those changes in the in the colors you see on the map, right, which might shift. Uh, you know, you know, you have to be aware of the color coding because you know, fifty one percent sometimes looks dark red, and then forty nine percent looks dark blue. Uh, but the shifts on the map come from the changes in the way that relatively more educated and affluent white voters are, are, are approaching this. Now, and it's something I didn't exactly talk about, but in, in the earlier parts of this, but you know, when Russell Pierce lost his, his Senate recall election in 2011, um, there were particularities about that race because it was run in, in an unusual form where there was no primary. But it was, you know, these were Mesa largely kind of conservative Mesa people <laughs> um, who decided we've kind of had enough of this, right? We're no longer on really, we were never really sure about this and we were okay with it, but now we're not so sure. Um, and that has been the story of kind of, you know, relatively educated white voters um, through the, the Trump era, of course. You know, it's not like, you know, all of those voters are now voting for the Democrats, not at all, but certainly Democrats have done a lot better among those voters. Um, so I don't know that it's the kind of, I think that's what you're seeing, right? And the inner, and of course, the political geography of this is that the good jobs and the ones for, you know, that educated people are likely to fill are usually close to the cores of cities. Um, and the exurbs are usually less, uh, usually have less educated demographics. So I think that's what you're looking at. But these, these broader changes, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, so there's a whole confluence of all sorts of people, right? Kind of changing their minds on stuff, being mobilized to do more things than before, uh, that all form part of this larger um, kind of combination of factors that lead to kind of a different sort of politics that, that we have around this now, as opposed to 12 years ago. Does that answer your question? I used to live in Coronado, which I think is the most democratic voting precinct in Phoenix. So <laughs> just, just to point that out. Anything else? Other questions? We have no more online uh, questions. So the in-person audience, chance to ask a follow-up question. Maybe a follow-up comment. Uh, of course, the, the valley as a whole has grown a lot. Yeah. And most of the new people coming in to get some of these high paying jobs do make it less conservative. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, a different way this played out in my eyes was the freeway system. Mm -hmm. I grew up playing on the approaches when they were building the 17. Yeah. And, with, and once it was built and went into operation in the mid 60s, late 60s, what it essentially did is it cut the city in half. Yeah. Because you couldn't get from east to west unless you went on the major mile streets. And so for the people living here that were adults, mm -hmm. that sowed them on freeway. And after the Black Canyon, that I-17, every other freeway got voted down until we got into maybe late 70s, early 80s, mm -hmm. where enough new people came in and didn't have that memory where all these other new freeways started yeah, getting yeah. approved. There's a lot to say. There's a lot to say about the fact that Arizona is such a high in migration yeah, exactly. state, right? Um, one of the lowest percentages of people born in the state were resident. And yeah. I think in Arizona, it's only about mid to high 30s percent, right? And we're starting to see more of them now. 
Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, you are, we are, um, you know, as change, various things change, but, you know, it's funny because at first the, the growth in Arizona post-World War II made the state a lot more Republican, right? Um, at first, that's what happened, uh, you know, in the boom years, the 50s, the 60s. And then it's consolidated. And now, of course, the, you know, the people who, do, who are migrating in from all sorts of places, other parts of the United States, um, other countries sometimes are tending to make the state um, or to be part of that mix of things that's making the state more politically competitive. Um, and yeah, I mean, in part because, uh, you know, but we shouldn't, my whole argument is that this really intense era around immigration did change things, right? And it's a huge part of trying to explain why. I mean, people have said that Arizona will be a purple state since I was like this high, right? Uh, now it has actually happened, right? In a, in a clearer way. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So, so that's finally occurred in the, this whole episode and the fallout from it is very important. Then. So maybe I can leave it there, yeah? Well, please join me in thanking our uh, special guest uh, for today, Professor Mike Flavin. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who came online. How long are you going to go? One of those two, another week. <laughs>